Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. Yes. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. Yes. I have a dream. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Because yes. I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream. That one day, every valley will be exalted. Every hill and mountain will be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of God shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jingling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing we will be free one day. Mountains are still being moved.
serve is the same yesterday, today, forever. You believe it's the same God that Dr. King and so many others before him built their lives on. And we believe that he's the same God that's still moving, that's still healing, that's still reconciling his people and his church into perfect unity under his perfect love. And so today, as we enter into worship, I invite you, one church, one body, one mind, let's lift up the name of Jesus together. Come on, here we go. Everything around me is shaking oh, I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus mm. He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail?
for his unfailing love. We serve a God who's faithful this morning. We serve a God who sees us, who loves us. And so, Father, today, God, we just pour out our praise to you, God, declaring that we love you, God. We thank you. And all my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song must stand and you never do. Come on, church, you sing it with us. Come on. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a come on, you sing it out.
by going to God in prayer together. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in the past and what you're doing right now. And we come to you this morning, no matter how we got here or what we're walking in with, ready to hear from you. We open our lives to you, for you to speak truth to us. It's in your name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, Traders Point. It's so good to be with you. My name is Anne. If I haven't gotten to meet you yet, I serve as one of the pastors here. And if this is your very first time with us, we especially want to say welcome to you. We are so glad you're here. I want to invite you to stop by Info Central on your way out today. And there we just want to give you a gift just from us to you. We don't need anything from you, but we'd love to just welcome you here and give you that. Well, we exist as a church to remove unnecessary barriers that keep people from Jesus. And it is because of that, that we pause and take a moment to honor Dr. King and what he lived out in removing barriers that not only kept people from Jesus, but also kept people from one another. And so it is because of that, and because of the truth that we know for those of us who follow Jesus, that heaven will represent every tribe, tongue, and nation, that we can take a moment today and say, God, we want heaven on earth, and we want it now. And so I wanna encourage you to take a moment this weekend. Um, we've got some resources for you that we put together just to help you um, take a moment and reflect and celebrate um, Dr. King. And those are things that you can both do in your own home or around our city. And our kids team also put together a guide for families with kids. And we encourage you to check those out. Well, before we keep going, our pastor is going to come and give a message. But before we do that, go ahead, say hello to some people around you, and then find your seat. Bible, go ahead and make your way over to Genesis chapter 2. Maybe uh, open up the app, grab something to jot a few notes down with. Uh, if you missed it last week, we kicked off a new series of messages for a brand new year called Reimaged, uh, Discovering God's Purpose for My Life. And uh, what we covered last week was this main idea that God made you on purpose for a purpose and that God doesn't make any mistakes, that he doesn't need a mulligan. You know, he didn't look at you and go, oops. You know, he's got a specific plan and a purpose uh, for you. And, uh, and so uh, all of us, I think, are sort of searching for what it exactly is that God has put us on this planet to do. And, and yet, I, I think that many of us would just have to admit that that can become a great source of frustration uh, for us because maybe it feels like uh, we don't know what it is or it's God's keeping it from us or it's somewhat elusive. Maybe in our more cynical moments, we begin to wonder if maybe God's kind of playing a game with us. Kind of, have any of you ever been to a ball game where they put up on the jumbotrons, the shell game, and they've got like a reward or a ball or something underneath one of the shells. And they're like, hey, keep your eye on the one that has the prize underneath it. And then they start moving around real fast and you're trying to trace it. And then they stop, hey, which one is it under? And you pick three, but it was really one. And I think sometimes maybe we kind of feel like God's kind of playing that game with us when it comes to discovering his purpose for our life. And he's like, you know, sorry, you went to the wrong school. You know, I, I'm sorry, you picked the wrong path. You chose the wrong person. And I just want you to know that God's not playing a game with us when it comes to discovering his will, his plan, his purpose for your life, uh, Jeremiah 29 says that God wants to give you a hope and a future, that that's like his desire, that he, he's not trying to keep it from you. He wants you to discover it. And you might say, well, if that's the case, then why does it keep eluding me? And there, there's any number of things that could be the culprit of that. But last week we, we said the big one is that uh, we live in a fallen world and everything is broken and messed up and not as it fully should be. And so on this side of eternity, we can see traces of heaven and hell. We can see traces of the light and yet we're very well aware of the darkness. We can see the good and the bad. That, that's part of it. 
is that we just kind of live in a flawed, broken, messed up uh, world. Uh, another uh, culprit could be, we talked about these two different things between God's general will and God's specific will. So God's general will could be sort of summarized in maybe the, the Ten Commandments and the greatest commandment. So love God and love others as yourself. That's like God's general will for everybody. And then out of that general will then comes his more specific will. And so we find ourselves in alignment with the general first and then he begins to lead us to the specific. But there could be a number of seasons or could, we could describe it as valleys that God uh, leads us through. He's with us in those valleys and it's painful and it feels like maybe he's silent. We're kind of wondering what, what is his intent in all of this, but actually he's preparing you for your calling. He's preparing you for that purpose. Mountaintop experiences are incredible. I hope you're on one. I hope you experience several this year, but as great as they are, it's usually the fruit that grows in the valleys. I just wish that wasn't true, but in reality, both from personal experience, observation, history, I just know that's the, the case, that when I just uh, experience pain and resistance, that's where I grow the most. And so it's not that God isn't good, it's just that he's in control and he's with you through those valleys, those experiences. And God wants you to know his plan and his purpose. And so last week, we kind of covered a lot of that kind of as a basis. This week where I wanna go is I wanna talk about um, work. And that, that could mean any number of things. That could, uh, maybe the thing that jumps to your mind is, you know, what you do for a job, your nine to five, how you make a living, your occupation, career. Uh, it doesn't have to be though. Could be just maybe the, the, the thing that you're naturally good at, the thing that you're producing, your contribution to the world, whether you work at home or outside the home. What, what is that thing that God has put you on this planet to do that just feels Productive. It feels like you're running in your lane. This is what you were created by God to do. And uh, don't you just love it when you go out somewhere, maybe it's a coffee house, restaurant, store or something, you, you come across somebody and it's so clear that they love their job. Don't you love to see that? Whether it's the barista at the coffee house or um, maybe it's the server at your restaurant who just steers you away from a certain thing on the menu and point you in another direction. I always appreciate that. Maybe it's the Uber driver that's got cold bottles of water in the back, the CEO who uses her influence to build up and develop others, the hairstylist who knows exactly what you want and how you want it, and she's emotionally intelligent to know if you want to talk or not. Don't you just love that? I just so appreciate that. Maybe it's the school teacher who uh, personalizes their teaching towards each a student and how they learn. It's the entrepreneur who risks everything to create something new as a contribution to the community. Maybe it's the mechanic who keeps your car on the road while being fair and honest, the stay-at-home parent who changes the world by investing in the next generation, or the DoorDash driver who delivers a burrito at midnight in the clutch. Don't you just love it when you see people that are kind of leaning into their calling? They just love what they do. It just makes all the difference. It certainly encourages me. And then it becomes pretty clear too whenever you run across somebody who doesn't love their job. Uh, uh, I ordered something right after Christmas, took a little while to get here and um, I was uh, monitoring it and I was here at the office this last week and I got one of those notifications that said that uh, the delivery had been made at my front door. And you probably have this where the driver takes a picture to confirm delivery. But this was the picture that I got on my phone and I just want you to <laughs> notice like anything unusual about it. It's in the grass, not at the door. Uh, it's wet outside, it's raining in the picture. But maybe the most peculiar thing is they clearly took that picture inside their car. And uh, that's not where my driveway is. So I'm sitting here looking at the picture going, are they in my front yard? Like, and so sure enough, I get home later that afternoon and uh, I'm asking Lindsay about it. She was like, yeah. She was like, I was at the window and I saw the whole thing. She said, this car is coming down her driveway. It turned, it's headed straight towards the house. She's like, I didn't know what to think. It pulls up to the side, just like that. They rolled the window down. She's like, am I about to be part of a drive-by? Like what was gonna happen? And they threw the package out and then snapped a fixture. I guess they didn't wanna get wet. I don't know uh, who this person was or you know, what kind of a day they're having. Cle clearly though, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's safe to say, this isn't their calling. Like this just isn't, <laughs> isn't what God kind of put them on the planet to do, praying for them, that they find the right lane to run in. And this is another little lesson, you know, be careful what you 
do with me because it might end up in a sermon. So, so <laughs> there, there was a national survey done a few years ago that asked people this question. What would you do if you just suddenly came across millions of dollars? Here was the top three answers. Number one was pay off debts. Number two, buy a new car. Number three, I would quit my job. In other words, I would go into my boss's office and tell them, take this job and give it to another deserving person. I don't know what's on <laughs> your mind there. It's just, I'm done with this. And in a sense, maybe you can relate to that. In another sense, I mean, how tragic. It's sort of this like idea, like the only reason why I'm going to work is to make some money. Now, now please don't misunderstand me. Uh, money's important. And we need it to provide for our families, be a blessing to others. Proverbs talks pretty extensively about work ethic and working hard. And yet, and I think many of us know this. We just need a good reminder of it from time to time. If you're only going to a job to make money, then that's not enough. Like it's not going to give you the fulfillment that you're looking for. Our motivation and reason for working, going to work, whether that's in the home or outside the home, whether you get paid or not, has to go beyond all of that to where we begin to just feel the pleasure of God in our life. And we're like, this is what I was put on this planet to do. And, and I don't know what your situation is right now. Those of you that are listening to my voice, taking this in, I don't know what the percentage would be right now of those of you that would kind of go, you know what, I am fully satisfied with my job. I love what I get to do. It's such a blessing. And, and I would imagine there's a number of you that feel that way, but I would, I'm just guessing that statistically speaking, there, there might be more of us that would say otherwise. And man, it's like, I dread going to work on Monday. Like I, I'm, I'm facing a toxic work environment. This isn't what I wanted to do. I never saw my life going this way. Maybe you're in a painful season of unemployment. There, there was a survey done by the Princeton Management Association that, that said this, that 40% of our waking hours are on the job and yet 82% of Americans say that they are often dissatisfied with their work. And that statistic has remained true uh, for the better part of four decades or so. So what this means is that we're spending about half of our waking time doing something that many of us don't find very fulfilling. Now, let me just say this. Now, not every job, you know, has to be your calling. Like not every job has to be like fully fulfilling. Like, I, I think that for, for many of us, uh, that would probably be just maybe something good that we need to hear because here's the deal. I, I, I've had some pretty crummy jobs in, in my past, but, I, but I, I, I appreciate all of them, even if they taught me what I don't want to do. Even if they helped me learn how to figure out how to work with really difficult people or get, gave me the grit to stick with it. I think all of us can think back to a first job or a worst job or a barely get by job. And, and uh, God can use that too. The worst job I ever had in my life. It only lasted a day. <laughs> I worked a 10 hour shift in a chicken house and I went uh, coop to coop, reaching through the cage, uh, unscrewing the little water spouts and then putting in a new one. I did that for 10 hours straight. It was as horrible as it sounds. Like it was worse. It was hell is what it was. And Lindsay and I were dating at the time. She picked me up from work. I got in the car. She said, how was it? And I said, I'm staying in school. That's, that's what I'm doing. I'm staying in school. I don't ever, ever, ever want to do that again. And so I can look back at that and go, yeah, but that, those 10 hours weren't wasted time. Still, I look back at that and that was character developing. And so I just want to say that, that, you know, it's, it's not as if we just have to like say, you know what, I am going to wait till the perfect job that kind of fits my calling. No, you just kind of jump in there. And as you go, God reveals some of that to you. And yet, at the same time, I would say that life is too short for you to work a miserable job or to stay in that. And I know that right now I'm, listening, I'm talking to a bunch of different people. There's some of you right now that are just starting off your uh, you know, vocational journey and you're trying to figure out, maybe you're getting ready to graduate high school, trying to figure out what you're gonna do next year. And there's all this pressure from maybe uh, mom and dad or, or friends of mom and dad and they're wanting you to declare a major and have it all figured out, or at least it feels that way. And so you get this, a bunch of pressure and you, you don't wanna mess it up. And maybe there's some of you in, in maybe midlife right now and you're like, you know what, I went after this degree and I've been working this job, but man, this just isn't working out. And, but but uh, right, now I've got, it, I've got people depending upon me and I, I, gotta, pre, I gotta provide. And, and, and so you, maybe you're trying to muster up the courage and the faith to maybe make a switch in midlife. Maybe uh, you, you have been very, very successful. Like it's not been hard for you to make 
a decent amount of money and to be successful, but yet you still feel empty inside. Maybe it's requiring a lot of time from you to travel and you're away from your family and it's killing your marriage and your relationship with your kids is suffering, and, but you, your family's kind of grown accustomed to that lifestyle. So what do you do? Or maybe you've, you've, made, you've sort of made it and now you're looking, to, what am I gonna do with all these resources to leave a lasting legacy? Those of you in retirement age, like, man, it's fantastic. You were able to retire from the job. But I just want to reassure you, you never retire from the kingdom of God. And it could be your last couple of decades of life, are gonna, you're going to believe your greatest contribution that you might ever make. Now, even those of us that may, maybe you're in, may, maybe none of that describes you. And you're like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm so blessed because I'm in my dream job. And even your dream job, though, is going to have a certain portion of it that's going to be difficult. It's the 80-20 principle. In any job, there's probably about 80% of it that you love and maybe 20% of it that, you know, you have to put up with or you got to navigate. Because in any job, we still have to deal with a broken world. And your coworkers are broken and your boss is broken and they're human beings. And so there's going to be difficult personalities. There's going to be unrealistic demands on your time. There's going to be unexpected challenges that pop up and this struggle that we have in the, in the workplace. And yet for many of us, maybe we just have kind of settled and we just kind of accept it as a necessary evil, something we have to do. You ever had somebody say to you, I think they mean well, but they say, you know, well, you have to work. And uh, technically speaking, there's some truth to that, but man, if you just have to do anything, then that's not very motivating. And it's certainly, I don't, I, I think it's not certainly not very inspiring and, uh, you're not necessarily leaning into God's calling for you. So where do we begin in all of this? And so I'm gonna uh, do some teaching here and then I wanna get real practical. And I just wanna encourage you to just kind of really lean in the remainder of our time together. I, I don't fully expect that everything that I'm gonna say is gonna be equally true or applicable to everybody listening to this. And it doesn't need to be. What, what, what I'm trying to do here, uh, if you could even see my, my notes, I, I've got some things that I've written down. They're mostly just suggestions. And I've got some stuff written down. And then I've got a little section of my notes that says, Aaron, preach here. That means go off script, right? That means like uh, speak and holy, let me get out of the way. And God, you, maybe I'm gonna speak from a place of preparation, but I also don't want my preparation to get in the way of God, what God might wanna say. And I don't know what it is that he might wanna say, but, but what is the one thing that he's saying to you and the one action step that he's asking you to make? I don't want you to miss it. So I want you to lean in, jot down a few notes. And so how do we discover God's purpose? Like how do we find a sense of fulfillment in our career, our occupation in the midst of this broken world? Let me start here. Uh, I want you to know this. God cares about your job. Now, maybe that's paid or unpaid. Maybe that's in the home or outside the home. God cares about what you're doing to fill your day. The influence that you make, the contribution that you provide. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way before. Like maybe you've sort of thought, well, I don't, I don't think God cares about what I'm doing right now. Actually, like this isn't what I wanna be doing full time. So God doesn't care. Or, or maybe you've just thought God only cares about ministry jobs like pastor, missionary, worship leader, a social worker, but that, that's not true. If you look at the pages of scripture, you see that most of the people in the Bible that God used worked non-religious vocations. So Joseph was an administrator for Pharaoh. Moses and David tended sheep. Uh, Peter was a fisherman. Lydia had her own garment business. Uh, Paul was a tent maker. Or something like 220 various occupations mentioned throughout the scriptures. Uh, Jesus, who was God in the flesh, spent most of his time on earth, not as a rabbi or a teacher, but as a carpenter working with his hands. I always felt somewhat convicted by that. I always was kind of under the illusion, like I, some of you know my story. I, I felt called by God uh, into ministry at a really young age, like the age of 19. I didn't even know what I didn't know. And I kind of put this unnecessary pressure on me that I have to have it all figured out by the age of 25. And if I don't, then I'm an abysmal failure. <laughs> Any of you ever felt that pressure? Yeah. And then, yeah, somebody said that right here. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty, <laughs> your vulnerability with the rest of us. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus didn't start his vocational ministry till the age of 30. That'll tell you something. He was like in no rush to do this. One time, this is one of the things I love about Jesus. I mean, clearly, and we'll even see it in our passage, that God rested from his work. This is called the, the Sabbath. And yet what many 
of us can do is we can take something and legalistically turn it into something that it, God never intended. So Jesus would say that man was made for the Sabbath, not Sabbath for, for the man. And, and so um, we can end up legalistically turning it into something that it wasn't supposed to be. That was true for Jesus. Jesus actually, I love this, he um, healed a lame man on the Sabbath which was considered work on a day when there wasn't supposed to be any work. And Jesus in his defense says this in John 5, 17. He says, my father is always at his work and to this very day, and I too am working. So we see here in Jesus that he, he considered work to be this incredible value. A.W. Tozer uh, one time said this, we have a common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular. And one of the things that I just want you to know, like if you are um, a Christian, and I realize not everybody that I'm talking to right now would consider yourself to be one, but, and maybe you kind of feel like you're struggling and stumbling through that walk. But right now, if you uh, have given your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides in you, you're seeking to be re-imaged into his character and likeness. There is no such thing as sacred and secular. It's all sacred. So you can go to your job, your nine to five, whatever it may be, sales, food service, management, whatever it is, it's all sacred because you brought the Holy Spirit with you. And so the, the, one of the things that we desire to do as a church is to bring authentic and real hope and help, real change to our city. And that's not g gonna happen by just us gathering together on the weekend like this. Now, I don't wanna underestimate this, this is really important, but there's a specific purpose for this. The author of Hebrews says, we gather together. Let's, let's not give up gathering together. Some are in the habit of doing this. Usually what ends up happening, it turns into a habit where we don't gather. And then he says, when we gather together, it's for the purpose of um, not you having a personal experience with God, although that can happen. It's stirring one another up. That's why we gather. We, we gather together because we know that you're nine to five, that the work week is gonna be hard. We're filling each other up, getting each other ready so that we can be ready to actually bring about real change in the community. That's the way that our church is gonna change the city. I was having lunch with a guy right before Christmas and he uh, um, leads a, uh, an organization here within our city and he's a part of a different church and he has never, I don't think he's ever been here, but we were just having lunch together and he said, you know, Aaron, he says, I really, I really, really love your church. And uh, I was like, well, tell me more. And uh, so he, he said, I really love your church. And, and, and I go, well, why? And he goes, well, here's why. He said, I know a bunch of just people that are influential in our community, people that are bringing about real change that are a part of your church. And I'm just so grateful for what God is doing there. And can I just tell you, that was so encouraging to me just to hear that, that that's the way that we'll bring about real Change, And I want to encourage you in that, especially those of you that maybe find yourself maybe in what you might call like an impossible situation at work. Whether that's just an unreasonable or abusive boss, um, co-workers that are constantly stabbing you in the back. Maybe it's um, uh, unrealistic demands on your time. You, you find yourself in this sort of pressure cooker. And maybe that could be where you need to be, uh, quote unquote, like a Daniel in Babylon, that, that there's people looking at you. How about this? Live your life in such a way that it requires an explanation. That others might look at you and go, man, what is so different about you? Now, now here's the thing. I gotta be careful about this. When I talk about Christians in the workplace, I'm not talking about you slapping a Jesus fish on your car or carrying around your coffee mug so everybody can see when God closes the door, he opens a window. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about shaming other people because they're listening to secular music and you're turning that off and sneaking in worship music. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, showing up on time, I'm talking about doing what you say you'll do, I'm talking about not losing your temper, not I'm talking about refusing to gossip, having a strong work ethic in, in such a way that people would look at you and say there's something fundamentally different about you. That, that's part of what, and, and we can't, uh, expect God to maybe reveal more or really lead us into our calling if we're at least not doing that at a bare minimum. You see, I think what everybody wants deep down is that sense that we found not just a career, but a calling. Like you just know, this is what God made me for. And last week we looked at that passage from Ephesians 2 verse 10. It says, for we are God's, and this is a word it uses, masterpiece. And he has created us a new in Christ Jesus, here's why. So we can do the good things. And that involves your work, 
what you produce, what you contribute to the world. And and he planned for us to do this a long time ago. So you're a masterpiece. God uh, is making you, re-imaging you anew in Jesus so that you can make a contribution where you're at. And he planned this out a long time ago. And meaningful work is a part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Part of the reason is because God himself works. The the fifth uh, word in the Bible tells us a lot about God. In Genesis 1, it says that God created. He went to work designing, planning, crafting, and building, and he found great pleasure in it. The Bible uses all these metaphors to describe God as a worker. In Proverbs chapter 8, it describes him as an architect and a builder. In Matthew 7, a teacher. Deuteronomy 31, a composer. Hosea 10, a farmer. Isaiah 64, a potter. Psalm 23, a shepherd. So that's part of the thing that compels us to be productive and to be creative and to make a contribution and to provide is because this is the nature of our Heavenly Father. He's a creator. He's a nurturer. He's a provider. And it says in Genesis 2, 2 through 3, on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. That's a whole other sermon that probably some of us uh, could use is knowing when to stop working and to just be and to just rest. That's what God did. And then in verse three, it says, God blessed the seventh day, declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. And right after he made Adam and Eve, he gave them a job to do. Now get this, God gave Adam and Eve work to do prior to sin entering into the world. So work preceded all of that. Work was a part of a perfect world. In Genesis 2, 15, it says, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. So who knew that landscaping was the world's oldest occupation? And I don't know how many of you love to landscape or garden, you got green thumbs, but imagine doing all of that in a perfect world. That means no more weeds. That means everything that you plant flourishes and produces. That means no insects are killing your tomato plants. That's what that means. And so all of this work existed prior to sin. Now, I don't know about you, but somewhere along the line, when I was growing up in church, I sort of got this idea uh, that work was the result of sin. That that work was the result of a fallen world. I don't know where we got that idea. As near as I can tell, it was probably Genesis 3, a misreading of those two verses. Verse 17, it says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. God's uh, sort of laying down the consequences on Adam and Eve for their rebellion. Cursed is the ground. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. And I think we maybe misread that to think, well, uh, work was the punishment God laid down upon of us, upon us because of sin. And that would be a misunderstanding. It's sort of like what I said last week. And I gave the illustration of the screen behind me that God made us in his image, but sin shattered that image. Same thing with work. God created work prior to sin and sin shattered that. It's, so, so the reason why work can be so painful And so trying is because it has been affected by our sin. And now that needs to be redeemed as well. You see, work is not the curse of sin. Sin has cursed the work, which means that God can reconcile that. God can redeem that. And we can conclude this, I think we can safely conclude, that if work preceded sin, then work will also be something that we find in heaven. I don't know how you feel about that. Some of you are like, oh man, I thought that we'd go to heaven and we'd just be kicking it on the beach with a little umbrella drink for eternity. And uh, um, I, I always, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and admit this, that there was a time in my life I really wasn't looking forward to heaven because I couldn't picture it. And I just thought that we would all go to heaven and we'd be bouncing around on white fluffy clouds wearing diapers, playing harps. And I just thought, you know, that might be cool for a day or so, but every day for eternity. And so I was kind of not looking forward to that. But see, we need to understand that all heaven is, is earth restored back to Eden 
back to its perfection, the kingdom of God coming to earth to bring reconciliation and restoration. And so we're gonna find meaningful work to do in heaven. And uh, Solomon, in all his wisdom in Ecclesiastes 3, said this, what does the worker gain from his toil? I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. That's calling, that's fulfillment. And then he says that everyone may eat and drink. And here's the term, find satisfaction in all his toil. What God wants is for you to find satisfaction in your toil. And then, he, and then he finishes this way. This is God's gift to you. This is the gift that God gives you. That, that if you are leaned in, you, you know why you're here. And you're running in the lane that God has kind of laid out for you. And you're chasing after that and fulfilling that. Then there, there is nothing more fulfilling than that. And if you're not, it is not too late to change course. It is not too late to have the courage to say, you know what, maybe I need to go back to school. Maybe I need to turn in my resignation. Maybe I need to go for that promotion. Maybe I need to make some sort of a change so that I can step into and lean into God's calling upon my life in this area. So if that's the case, then how do you find it? Well, in Romans chapter 12, I just wanna get real super practical for the next few moments. Romans 12 verses three and six say this, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. So that's this idea of not what I, how could I say it this way? Not what I would like to be true about me, but what's reality about me. Like being honest about my giftedness, what God has called me to do. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So that's a statement of fact that God has given you a gift and he's created you in a specific way to do th things well. So let me just take us through like three very practical, very simple questions. I think that for many of you, uh, this may just be review, but timely review. And for others of you, maybe this is a word that you need at this time in your life. How, how do you know what God has called you to do? How do you recognize that? Well, here's the first question. What gifts and abilities has God given you? There's a number of ways you can answer that question. Some of you probably just kind of intuitively know it right now. Like you know what you're just kind of naturally good at. Maybe others have affirmed that in you. Maybe you've taken uh, any number of the battery of tests that are out there right now. Uh, Myers-Briggs, Strength Finders, Working Genius, any number of those. And they're all helpful tools to just try to help you figure out what your gifts and abilities are. Family of origin, kind of your previous experiences. What have you done that others have affirmed? What are you just naturally sort of good at? There was a study done by the Princeton Research and Marketing Corporation that found that 50 to 80% of all Americans are in careers that don't match their gifts and abilities. And few things are as frustrating as being in a role that doesn't match your gift strengths and abilities. Here's the second question. So the first is, what are, what are my gifts? Second is, what are you passionate about? And, and there's a difference. See, uh, God has put a set of motivations and core passions within all of us. It's that thing that when you think about it, when somebody talks about it, when you see it, when you experience, you sort of light up and you're like, man, I am passionate about that thing. Now, you know, here's where um, we really need to pay attention because you can be using your natural gifting and still miss your calling because you don't have a passion for where you are applying it. So for example, you might be really gifted to teach, but maybe right now you're teaching high school geometry. That's really important, but maybe uh, that's not your passion. Your passion is maybe teaching elementary students. And so if you could make that shift, then that's when you'd really begin to come alive. That's when you begin to really lean into your passion. Or you might be gifted to lead a team of people in an established organization, uh, but maybe that company's been around for a while and what really brings you to life is uh, thinking uh, out into the future and innovating and being an entrepreneur. And man, if you could find, use your gifting to step into that, then you'd really come alive. You might be gifted to uh, uh, sell things, but uh, your passion is to make a lasting impact on the kids who live under your roof and call you mom and dad. And so for a season, you're like, you know what? They're my full-time effort. They are my passion. I've noticed that many people use their gifts to make a living in their nine to five, but they use those same exact gifts expressing passion in another. 
And so maybe you make your living using your gifts in a boardroom, but then you express your passion using many of those same gifts to maybe lead a nonprofit organization or maybe some sort of a ministry team uh, around here. I have been um, on trips with doctors, dentists, school teachers who get on a plane, fly to the other side of the world in Kenya, and they exercise their gifts and their education that they've maybe spent years and lots of money on, but they're really passionate about serving those in the slums of Kenya. And you see those two things come together and it is a beautiful thing to witness. Every week I see people that are maybe making their living doing something else, but man, they show up here. I've seen CEOs out in the freezing cold parking lot directing traffic and real estate agents that are serving kids in kids ministry and uh, people that use their vacation time in the summer so that they can go to camp with our students and be a mentor of a discipleship group. See, you can find your paycheck apart from your passion, but you cannot find your calling apart from your passion. So what are you passionate about? What are you gifted? What are you passionate about? Here's the third one. And maybe this is one that we have a tendency to overlook at times. It's just simply this question. What is God saying and how has he shaped you from your past experiences? So you look back over your life and just kind of do an evaluation. You know, where did I come from? And what was my educational background? And what are some of my first jobs? And what are some of my defeats and some of my, uh, uh, you know, times when maybe I just kind of fell on my face? What about my spiritual walk? What has God been saying through all of that? Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 uh, from the message wisely advises us, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given and, and then sink yourself into that. And then it says, don't compare yourself with others. Don't compare yourself with others. God has got a plan specifically for you. And if he is sovereign, if you are in fact a masterpiece, that he has planned the days of your life out, then there isn't any season of your life, even the most painful ones that aren't ordained by him. And he wants to use, he has a plan and a purpose for you. I, um, about 10 years ago, I got on a plane, went to another city and uh, spent two to three days doing something called a life plan. I don't know if any of you have ever done this. Uh, it's developed by a guy by the name of Tom Patterson. There's a number of people that have kind of developed these, but here's what a life plan is. Um, I got away in a room with a facilitator and uh, basically I walked in and all the walls were these blank sheets of paper and we just sat down and he just said, hey man, tell me your story. You know, where'd you grow up? You know, tell me about college, your education, jobs, uh, what you felt like God was calling you to do. I just kind of rattled through the whole thing. I probably talked for about three hours and he was just taking notes, just periodically asking questions, mostly listening. He, we get done with all that. He goes, hey, why don't you take about a 45 minute break? So I got a little courtyard area and I'm checking email, checking texts and uh, come back in after 45 minutes and the whole wall, all the papers filled up. And it was my life. And it was almost like written out, kind of like a narrative arc. And uh, each little section, he had like chapter one. It's kind of written out like a book, like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And he said, hey, uh, I want uh, you to go through here and I want you to give a title to each chapter of your life. And I just want you to notice this kind of arc to what God is kind of doing and saying in your life. I've shared with you all before that, um, and I just briefly made reference to it, that you know, I felt called by God in early age to go into ministry, but most of my 20s were really, really difficult. There was a season where I just wanted to get out of ministry for a while. I was about burned out, if I'm being really honest, like it took a toll on our marriage and I was kind of come to the end of myself and I was just like, I don't understand what you're doing. I'm giving this my all and it doesn't feel like it's working. And so what if I've kind of misunderstood your calling, plan and purpose for my life? And I wasn't looking for, for Trader's Point. I didn't apply for this job, wasn't looking for it. And God, it was really, it's too long of a story to even go into now, but God opened up this door. I came here when I was 31 and it was like a rocket ship. And it was very disorienting to me because I had just gone from feeling stuck and I was throwing everything I had at it. And honestly, if I'm being really honest, I was probably a bit too prideful and sure of myself. And I came here very unsure of myself. <laughs> my basic goal was uh, just don't kill it. That was pretty much my aspiration. Like, I don't want to get in the cockpit and dive the thing down into the ground. And, and so I get here and it's like a rocket ship. And people were asking me, what are you doing different? I was like, I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. And so uh, I'm 38. So I've been here about six, seven years or so <laughs> at the time. And I uh, go to my life plan. And I get to that point in my life plan at the time. This was nine years ago. 
And he goes, what are you thinking? And I said, I'm so disoriented because it was either like valley, 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 all of a sudden to the, straight to the mountaintop. And I don't really understand like what God's doing. What if he takes me into another valley? And honestly, when I look at the growth of Traders Point and I look at the influence and the impact in the last few years, it scares me to death. And he goes, why? And I said, well, if we were to get into a time machine and go back to 20-year-old Aaron Brockett and throw this all up on the board, I would be ecstatic. But I would assume that God achieved all that by the age of 67. And then I would retire and go off into the sunset, but I'm only 38. And that scares me to death. And he goes, well, and these were his words. He said, well, do you feel like in a sense that you've sort of scaled your Mount Everest and you're kind of at the top? And I was like, I guess so. Yeah, I guess I could say it that way. And he goes, so why does that scare you? And I go, well, have you seen all those Everest documentaries? People that get to the top, they die of oxygen deprivation. Like they, they don't make it back down. Like usually something bad happens and I'm like, I'm uh, up here to this, like where else do we go from here? I'm not quite sure. And then in that moment, he said, well, well that's a good point. He goes, how about um, you realize, you've just realized something that most leaders fail to realize until it's too late. And then he said these words, it's not about you. And it was in that moment that we developed out of that life plan. It's like, what if, Instead of just trying to keep staying up on this mountaintop, we start throwing lines down to other people, men and women, to help them figure out what their Mount Everest is. Guys, that's when it came back. We started developing a plan for multi-site. That's when we started developing a plan for the leadership residency. That's when when I was like, I'm not gonna preach every Sunday. I'm gonna start giving this stuff away so that way we can develop people. It's this idea that the NFL teams that are a legacy aren't the ones that win two or three Super Bowls. They're the ones that raise up a whole family tree of coaches that send them out to other teams. And they win a combined like 30 Super Bowls. That's what we're, the big C church. And can I just say to you, there was a tremendous amount of freedom in that to recognize maybe right now, uh, the point of frustration for you when it comes to your career. And I wanna say this lovingly, I don't, I don't mean for this to, to hit in a way that is, be har- is harsher than I intend. But could it be that too much of the focus is still on you? And God's trying to pull your eyes up off of that because it's not about you. He's for you. Please don't hear me say anything other than that. He is for you, but it's not about you. The minute that we can begin to recognize that he is at work and he wants to work through us and use us in the lives of other people, it's the minute that we step into the freedom for what it is that he's called us to do. You're calling and you can find great pleasure in that. Some of you uh, right now today, um, maybe this message has been painful for you to listen to because you're in a work environment that is really a struggle. Maybe you're just in a season of, un- of extended unemployment. You thought you'd have a job by now, but it doesn't seem like God's opening up any doors. And we wanna pray for you. And so we've just created a little bit of space right here before we conclude our time in a time of worship where you can just come. We'll have prayer counselors here down front and kind of in the middle of the room as well. They'll have lanyards on. And you could just go and just walk up and just simply say, man, I just need God to intervene in my work. Or maybe I'm I'm just in a season of unemployment and I need God to provide a way. And we would just love to pray for you. And then we'll wrap up our time together in a time of worship. Would you stand to your feet and let me pray. Father, we come to you right now and we trust you. We trust that you have a plan. And yet at times it is a struggle. And uh, Lord, I just um, pray that you would allow us to not just work a job, but to find our calling and to be certain about that. And I know that there's probably a fair amount of frustration and pain uh, in the room and with those listening around this subject. And so I just pray that right now we could just call out to you that your Holy Spirit would minister to hurting hearts, that you would give a resolve and a clarity and a peace around our next steps vocationally. And so would you show up, would you speak? We're listening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Would you come so that you can be prayed over for just a few moments and then we'll end in a time of worship.
So I throw up my hand, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah so come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your soul cause you've got a to invite you to either come up here there's some of our prayer team um, all around the room and we would be honored to pray with you so f please feel free to come up really quick before you go for the 7th through 12th graders in the room or in your life our youth night is coming up this Saturday you will not want to miss it you can get all the information on our website we will see you guys next week we love you see you next week